Ben Hyven and Karen for Swarms. And as the usual, um, uh, commercial about the uh, the book, Beekeeping a Practical Guide, which uh, I'm told is uh, is not available uh, temporarily uh, again. Um, and of course, Dave Cushman's website that hopefully all beekeepers um, uh, should should know about. Um, so uh, swarms have changed in my time in beekeeping. Um, and they're not always like, like the books say, because the books are really telling you what should happen naturally. Um, and sadly, um, they're very, very different. They're behaving very, very differently than they should do. <laughs> and of course, the more people come into beekeeping, uh, the more they um, think that what they see now is normal. And I'm afraid, folks, from, certainly from what I see, uh, it isn't. Uh, they used to be very reliable pre the sort of 1990s, so 25, 30 years ago. If you came across a large swarm, it would be a prime swarm, there would be a fertile queen in it, unless the beekeeper um, did something um, to, uh, to help it along, such as a typical thing was you'd have a, a clip queen, <laughs> wouldn't get noticed that she swarmed, out she'd come, uh, couldn't get back in, and of course, the swarm would take off with one or more of the uh, uh, of the virgin queens. Uh, but in general, uh, swarms should have a fertile queen, and the smaller swarms, of course, will be casts uh, with one or more virgin queens again. And literally, you could just, just chuck them in a hive. Um, if the uh, uh, queen was fertile, clip a wing. Uh, you put. If it's early in the season, put one or two supers on. If it's later, just put one. Um, leave it alone for the rest of the season, and um, uh, you could uh, you could go along. Uh, you wouldn't it really have to give it any uh, attention apart from uh, just check for disease, um, because having swarmed once, so unlikely to swarm again. Uh, they often gave us a crop. They built up nicely for the winter. <clears throat> may or may not supersede towards the end of the year and probably wouldn't have to feed them uh, anyway. Um, but uh, that, that's a very different situation than we have now, uh, where I admit swarms can be as the natural ones I just told you, though more often uh, a large swarm has either got a virgin queen or several virgin queens or a failing queen in it, and it's a small swarm that's got a failing fertile queen. So it's basically the other way around from what it should be. Um, now, fertile queens um, often soon fail, and I've come across so many beekeepers who say, oh, uh, the, my, my, my queen in the uh, swarm uh, failed or superseded or even disappeared. Uh, why is that then? <clears throat> Well, of course, it's the queen problems that I've been telling everybody about for 20 years, where young queens uh, fail and get superseded. And of course, up go the, um, uh, uh, up go the uh, cells and a colony then swarms on either emergency or supersedure cells. And of course, that's why we get, um, uh, get the wrong queens, the wrong swarms, if you get what I mean. Now, I'll say straight away, and I'm sure I've said it several times before, um, that colonies will swarm on all kinds of queen cells. Forget what it says in the books and the booklets and the, all sorts of things like that, where they say that they only swarm on swarm cells. They will swarm, if everything's in the right condition, they will swarm on emergency and supersedure cells. Now, some of these swarms can be very small, and I've seen them hardly bigger than a tennis ball. Uh, the smaller they are, the more likely to be riddled with varroa. Um, so I think probably they're coming from collapsed or collapsing uh, colonies. So about swarms, then, if they're good, um, they will have a mix of ages. Now, I know the books will tell you that, oh, the queen goes with half the flying bees or whatever. Uh, oh, no, she doesn't. Um, there are far more young bees than usually thought in a swarm. Just have a look. And um, if you get a proper swarm, not something that's uh, come as a result of a, a queen failure, um, but you look at a proper swarm and you'll see uh, bees there of all ages. And in fact, in about 1940, Rothamsted did some experiments 
um, Dennis Morland and um, uh, uh, Colin Butler did some experiments and they found that 70% of bees in a swarm were less than 10 days old. Well, of course, they haven't flown yet. So um, what we're told is actually uh, wrong. <coughs> if you've got a good fertile queen in there, they're usually laying within a day. And um, on many occasions, I've put a swarm in a, uh, in a skep, left it overnight to hive it the following morning. You get a piece of comb about the size of your hand and the queen has already laid in it. Swarms are brilliant for comb building. Um, and in fact, you can look at bees in a swarm and you can see the, um, uh, the uh, plates of wax, uh, the wax scales on the um, underside of the abdomen of the, uh, uh, of the bees. They're really good for comb building because, of course, they're set up for it um, because that's what they think they might have to do if indeed bees sink were when they swarm. <clears throat> Now, the population won't rise for at least three weeks until, of course, you get a full cycle of uh, brood. Now, I know a lot of beekeepers will tell you that uh, as soon as a swarm goes in, 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 into a hive, um, the, um, uh, the population uh, rapidly diminishes. That is not actually the case. And well, not, uh, not with an, a, a, a normal swarm anyway. Uh, as I've already mentioned, if they're early swarm, they can produce a crop. And the great thing about a swarm is that um, certainly for the few, first few days, it hasn't got any brood to feed. So, of course, it can store um, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, nectar. Personally, I think a good swarm is really good for beginners. I know the view that you should never give big beginners a swarm, but um, uh, I think it's a brilliant way for a beginner to learn. Uh, here's a piece of comb that I um, mentioned uh, 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 a few minutes ago. Uh, that was actually taken out, out of a skep. And although there probably aren't any eggs in that, um, if it's a fertile queen, I'd normally expect it to be, uh, uh, be eggs in it. <clears throat> so the negative comments about uh, swarms then, oh, don't go anywhere near them, they're bad tempered or they're diseased or they swar come from stalk, swarmy stock. Um, either kill them or leave them alone. Yes, I come across some uh, uh, household names, beekeeper-wise, uh, with that sort of advice, which I think is uh, sad. And as I already mentioned, don't give to beginners. Um, why on earth not? It's a much better way of learning than um, uh, just taking a five-cone nu nucleus off a, a, a carrier that's been set up. Um, by uh, by somebody else. <coughs> so my views on swarms, please always collect them if you're on the swarm list or you're asked to, to collect them. Um, because if they do happen to be in poor condition or they're poor bees or something, it takes them out of circulation. Uh, so they're not likely to go into somebody's chimney or their uh, cavity wall or a tree or something. And um, until the winter takes it out, um, they're not going to have their drones uh, uh, flying. Uh, it also avoids somebody else uh, taking up beekeeping who doesn't want to. And there's an awful lot of people with, uh, with bees in their chimneys that, that would rather not, uh, not have them there. Uh, of course, if we, as beekeepers, collect swarms, it does avoid a massive problem for the um, general public. Now, in the past, I used to requeen most swarms that I came across simply because my bees were better than um, most of those surrounding. Uh, but now I find there's actually some quite good stock out there. So what I tend to do is um, uh, set them up and then leave them to see what they're like, because it's only a personal view, but I think free living colonies are getting better than they were 10, 15 or 20 years ago. And there are actually some quite good um, uh, free living colonies out there. So, um, so don't, don't waste what could possibly be a good resource. So the swarming, <clears throat> it could be one of yours or it could be from somewhere else. If the latter, uh, it could come from a managed colony or a free living the problem is you don't really know the origin unless, of course, somebody saw it come out of a, uh, a building or a tree or a, 
uh, or somebody else's hive. Now, if they're yours, I think um, uh, you should treat them differently than if perhaps they come from somewhere else. And I will uh, speak a little bit more about that if they are your own swarm. But for now, I'm going to assume that um, uh, everything is collected from somewhere else and you don't really know the origin of it. So until I tell you, um, think that I'm talking about uh, a swarm collected from somewhere else. We do have swarm collectors list. Most beekeeping associations have got them, although some um, uh, don't. Um, I know some that don't because some... Um, uh, they don't want their beekeepers to have uh, these bad swarms that are out there. Um, they tend to be either local or national or both. Um, certainly the BBKA have got a, a swarm collectors. I assume the Welsh and the Irish and the, the Scots have, 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 have got one as well. Please, please, please help your local coordinator. Try to be as cooperative as you can because it's not an easy job i've never never really done it i've only done it in um uh, partly um but if you're uh taking half a dozen or a dozen phone calls every day and you're trying to get people to uh, uh to go to swarms it really isn't easy when you've got um somebody on the other end saying that uh, they're worried about their grandchildren getting uh getting uh, killed <clears throat> If you do go on the swarm collectors list, commit for the whole summer. Um, sadly, some people go on the collectors list um, because they've uh, lost some bees during the winter and they think it's a cheap way, an easy way of building up the numbers. Once they've got the numbers, uh, they then don't uh, commit for the rest of the summer and don't go and collect any more swarms or refuse to go, which... Um, uh, if I come across any of those, I generally have a fairly strong word with them. At the end of the day, it's really a service to the public because I think it's fair to say the vast majority of swarms come from uh, beekeepers, and really it's a it's a good PR uh, exercise. I mentioned most likely to come from beekeepers. Why? Well, either not controlling swarming. Uh, it could be that... Um, they think, oh, I always let my bees swarm because what they generally mean is they're too lazy to look, look, um, look, look, look at their colonies, and that, that is being irresponsible. Um, also, it could be perhaps a beginner doesn't really understand the process or what to do. Well, that is forgivable. There's no problem uh, with that. But people who deliberately don't, um, uh, don't deal with their swarming, I think, is irresponsible. Leaving two queen cells. Um, we had that discussion at the earlier uh, session. Uh, I just wish all those people that advise leaving two queen cells uh, will get on a swarm collector's list. And every time as a swarm goes in a chimney in their locality, they are the ones appointed to go and collect them because uh, leaving two queen cells is, is an absolute sure way of, or almost sure, of uh, producing um, uh, swarms. Um, so in the end, I think many of the fault of the beekeeper. So I think probably it's beekeeping that should try and put it right. But if somebody um, uh, consults a, a list, if you're going as a result of that, they may see you as a representative of that organisation. So um, try and behave yourself as best as you can. And you really do, if you're collecting swarms and you want to go on the collector's list, you really need to be quite competent at doing it. And I think I've got something on the next slide on that. No, the one after then. Um, this is not one of our Whisper Green members, but it's somebody fairly close. Um, they contacted me and said that they got um, uh, several swarms in their trees and uh, it couldn't be their bees because um, they've, uh, uh, they've done what they were told to do. So I went along, and these were three of them. I think they're about five altogether. Three of them altogether. And I asked the beekeeper what they'd done. And what they'd done was they'd actually left um, some emergency cells. I don't know what had happened, but the, uh, I think they took a queen away or something like that. And there's some, some emergency uh, cells. And they'd read in a booklet 
Um, I don't know which one. I haven't got a clue. I read in a booklet uh, that bees don't swarm on emergency cells. There's proof that they do because um, I, uh, I found them. And there's a photograph. So if people tell you that bees don't swarm on emergency cells, go and find somebody else to get your advice from. Now, before you go on the list, I think you need to fully understand the, the uh, swarming uh, process. Um, if you don't know it, then uh, find out. And um, uh, you also need to know how swarms are going to behave as well. Um, not just collecting, but also when you put it in a, in, in a hive. Um, I think you need to have a reasonable amount of experience of collecting swarms. Um, well, that's okay, because uh, if you are a beginner, all you need to do is ask one of the swarm collectors if you can go along with them next time. Really, if, if you pick up two or three swarms with the help of somebody else, I think most beekeepers are reasonably competent at doing that. But in any case, um, I think your local uh, beekeeping association uh, should teach you about collecting swarms uh, anyway, we certainly do it with Whisper Green. Those who want to go on the Swarm Collectors list. Now, I'll warn you right now, um, they aren't all the textbooks ones where they're five foot up an apple tree or whatever, and um, uh, they can be just dropped into a skip. Um, they actually are quite rare. Um, but, of course, it's lovely to write a book and have, the, have, a, uh, have photographs of them. But... Uh, where they can't find photographs, of course, they do drawings, don't they? <clears throat> One thing you really ought to do is to learn about things that can possibly be confused with bees, such as wasps, hornets, bumblebees, solitary bees, and even hoverflies. Don't just um, uh, sort of look at the, the pictures and that. You need to know a, a bit about um, the, their nesting habits and all sorts of things like that, because... If somebody tells you, oh, I've got um, uh, uh, bees in my bird box, it's likely to be uh, bumblebees and one species in uh, particular. If bees are in the ground, it's likely to be uh, solitary bees. So you can really um, narrow down um, what, what it is, because I can tell you it's not always honeybees. Don't forget you're dealing with non-beekeepers. Um, they some are likely to panic, uh, some aren't, and they do vary a lot. And I think I've got something on the next slide about that. Um, some can actually be quite painful, so you need to have a little bit of patience and uh, understanding because don't forget they've got something turned up that they didn't ask for. Um, uh, somebody's already told them there's a 50 or 150,000 uh, bees in a swarm. Or, 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 or whatever it is, and they got. Um, they've also heard about these uh, African killer bees, and uh, they put two and uh, two and two together and come up one hundred and fifty-eight. Um, and uh, um, uh, they are probably justifiably uh, frightened. So swarms, then they're often in a rush, and they arrive quickly. So somebody who's sitting out in the garden, um, they probably hear them coming late because they think it's ooh, something else. Uh, and literally within five or perhaps 10 seconds, um, they've got a garden full of, uh, 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 full of bees. So they do arrive uh, quite quickly. And if you're not a, a beekeeper and all you've heard is the bad stuff, uh, unless you've known a beekeeper or some in the family in the past, um, yet yeah, it's, it's justifiable that you're going to be a little bit alarmed. So you need to get there um, as quick as you can. So get your kit ready. Mine's always in my car uh, anyway. Um, not one lot usually, but, um, but uh, two lots, together with some more indoors because um, I have picked up as much as six forms in a day. Now, I'll repeat that... Um, Swarms are frowned upon by some beekeepers, but they really aren't a danger if you as a beekeeper are careful. And if you collect them and you do actually need bees, uh, they are free. But not only that, 
I can tell you, even after 56 years of keeping bees, I still find it interesting and enjoyable collecting swarms because basically every year I get a different situation uh, every, every time. It might just be uh, the people, but it could well be the bees as well, where they decided to, um, uh, to cluster, all sorts of things like that. And really, as, uh, if I'm... If I'm handing bees, I find it really enjoyable. You've got to be absolutely honest. <clears throat> if it's too difficult for you, either it's you, you you've you've got a lot of experience and you know it's going to be difficult to get um, bees out of where they decided to go, or you're inexperienced and you don't think you can manage it. Be honest. Say sorry, I can't deal with this. Don't fudge it. Whatever you do, don't fudge it because. Um, You'll get um, you'll get deeper and deeper in the mire, and you'll get to get found out. Um, you are the one person that needs to be calm. Uh, this isn't bomb disposal, and I did turn up um, to a swarm on one occasion. I did check to see if anyone else had been asked, and no, 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 no. But then somebody decided they'd contact somebody else. When I got there, there was this buffoon with. Um, uh, electric fence posts um, about 30 yards from the swarm, putting them out with, together with this um, uh, tape that you get for, you know, accidents and that sort of thing. And he was insisting that um, uh, that nobody went inside and all that sort of stuff. And uh, anyway, by the time he set up this lot up, the swarm had gone anyway. But you need to be calm. You need to take control uh, uh, straight away. If you don't, if you're on the list, uh, don't just say, oh, sorry, I can't take any more, because in your local association, you've probably got somebody who will, will take them. Um, okay, you could say to them, if they're an experienced beekeeper, well, I know where there are some, but if they're a beginner and you know that a beginner needs bees, if you can get hold of a beginner quickly, um, uh, give them a call or text or whatever you want to do and um, uh, try and take them out uh, with you, but try and have somewhere to put them. So your kit then, <clears throat> well, smoke is a pretty handy piece of piece of kit, but of course you need fuel with it and matches at, or a lighter or something, some way of setting fire to this fuel. And it does happen that people rush out the door and uh, forget something. Hive tool is always useful. I know you haven't got a hive there, but it's all it's surprising what you have to do. And a hive tool is incredibly, um, incredibly handy. Take several queen cages because you could have a situation where you've got a, a, a swarm with several virgin queens in. If you can find them, of course, one in each uh, cage. Make sure one's wired. And I'll show you why a little bit uh, later. And also your clipping and marking kit is um, uh, you'll find very useful uh, as well. You need some sort of bee-proof container. I've got a couple of three skeps. Um, might even have more, but, um, uh, you know, a, a skep is a really useful piece of kit. Poly nukes are um, quite good. They're light. Um, size is just about right. And for collecting a swarm, to me, is about the best use for them because um, I don't uh, don't like them for what they were uh, designed for, or perhaps a toughish cardboard box. Don't get something with a, uh, the, a um, uh, that's uh, that's weak and got um, got a bottom that fold, f folds out. Now, the the container is actually quite important. Don't use anything that's smooth, such as a plastic bucket because when you turn it upside down, the bees can't click on it, cling on it, and they just uh, uh, just fall out en masse. So it needs to be something um, uh, sensible. Um, I know, or I knew rather, of a beekeeper who uh, uh, had got one of those Alibaba baskets from somewhere and uh, cut, the, uh, cut the bottom off that. and. Uh, that 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 was used for years. That was, and that that's absolutely fine. It's effectively a skep. <clears throat> you need something to hold them in. Uh, sack is useful, although of course these days uh, 
nowhere near as many Hessian sacks as there were. But you can get uh, Hessian if you know a, a bricklayer. Um, they put it on um, uh, uh, laid bricks on in frosty weather. Um, you know, grab a couple of three meters of that. That's all right. Some sort of cloth, tablecloth, or a sheet. Um, make sure the bees can breathe through it, but the bees can't get um, uh, can't get through it. <coughs> When I've run out, I've tended to use, I've used a duvet cover on several occasions, um, a pillowcase, um, single size, not a big, big one. And I've even used a carcass bag. Um, somebody gave me a couple from a, a, an abattoir years ago, and I've used them. Now, if you get something like that, you need to be very careful that bees don't sting you if you grab hold of it. So um, if let's say you've got a, uh, a hanging uh, branch you can put the duvet cover or the carcass bag over the swarm wrap it around the top give it a good shake wipe it off and then just um uh, uh tie around the top and um uh, i've found them uh very useful an old dry comb don't have a wet one have a dry one because um sometimes you get bees in uh, places where they're a bit reluctant to come out of, where if you put a comb there, the chances are they're going to climb onto the comb, and then um, uh, you can um, uh, you can then shake them into your um, uh, container. I have got an, an example a little bit later on. Secateurs are incredibly uh, useful um, because. It's, it's not just what the uh, swarm is on, but sometimes just um, uh, cutting away vegetation is useful and a folding pruning saw is really useful. And you can, you can buy them online for less than a fiver. Uh, so that's certainly what mine costs. They don't have to be anything uh, too great and they don't have to be uh, really tough ones. Uh, but, um, you know, if you've got something an inch thick and it's a, a, a bell that doesn't matter too much, it's sometimes easier just to cut it off than um, uh, than to try and entice the bees uh, off or, or the swarm off it. String uh, and make sure it's um, something like baler twine uh, that doesn't stretch or light rope. I would say sash cord, but um, uh, sash cord probably isn't uh, used much these days. Uh, but that sort of thickness. Um, you can um, uh, you you can tie it up quite quite neatly. <clears throat> a garden spray filled with water is ever so ever so useful, um, and I'll give you a reason for that a little bit later on. Always worth taking a spare veil or two, because <clears throat> it's surprising how many uh, um, of the general public will be quite happy just to get up close to bees. Some people are incredibly good, and it's doing them good. It's the, it's doing the uh, the the craft good. Uh, they're learning. Okay, you might take a bit of time explaining things to them, but that doesn't matter. It's it's learning overall. And last but by no means least, take a camera because um, uh, even if it's only for your uh, own um, uh, sort of in, entertainment. Um, but I've I've certainly used a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of my uh, photographs in in presentations. So the call comes in, <clears throat> and what do you do? Well, ask questions. Don't just say yes. I'll be around in ten minutes or something. Ask questions because you can go on a wild goose chase incredibly easy. <clears throat> ask where they live. I'm in West Sussex, and about three years ago, um, I had somebody from Leicester, which is about 150 miles away, 150, 160 miles away, phone me up. Um, so find out where, where they live. Of course, the internet and they, that sort of thing. These days, um, people don't put their addresses uh, down, so uh, other people don't know uh, where they are. How on earth they got hold of me, I, I, I've no idea. Uh, but even if it's 20 or 30 miles away, you probably know somebody a bit a uh, bit closer. How long have the bees been there? If they say, oh, a week or so, um, then um, uh, they're going to have built 
if they're out in the open, they're going, if they're honeybees, they're going to have built a, um, um, uh, a sizable nest. Uh, if they're in a bird box, the chances are they're, they're bumblebees. If they're in the ground, they're going to be likely to be solitary bees. So uh, ask them how long they're there. Did they see them arrive? Uh, yes is a good sign. Uh, no is, uh, is not such a good sign. Where are they? Are they in a tree or a bush or um, even in the chimney, cavity walls? Are they in the ground, in the shed, in the bird box? Um, because all of those are likely to sh shed a, a bit of doubt. Because if they're in a cavity in a tree, um, you're not going to get them out. But if they're in a bush, then you've got a fair chance. If the chimney you haven't, cavity walls you haven't. If they're in the ground, they're not going to be honeybees. If they're in the shed, uh, you don't know. If they're in a bird box, I've only ever taken honeybees out of one bird box. Um, uh, but they're likely to be bumblebees. What size are they? Are they football size, rugby ball size, tennis ball size? Um, several years ago, I had, well, they're in my conservatory. Oh, how many are there? Two. They're bumblebees. <clears throat> how high are they? Now, it's surprising how many people think that six feet up is actually 20 feet up. And I'm not joking, folks. I by a very long way. But what I do these days is related to something. Is it as high as the, the, the top of the door or the, uh, the downstairs window or a gutter or something of that, uh, of that nature? Because anything a bit more on the head height and you're going to need uh, some sort of access equipment, a pair of steps, a ladder, or um, in extreme cases, a cherry picker, uh, in, in order to get them. Are there any hazards? <coughs> Are the pond a greenhouse? And you might think, oh, well, what's he on about? Well, take the greenhouse. I got called out um, uh, once to a swarm, and I have to say I was a little bit late because I had another one to collect anyway. When I got there, imagine this. A big, tall um, wall or, uh, a wall of a wall garden, and it was probably eight foot tall, I should think. Imagine a greenhouse leaning up against it, and a big cedar tree, the other side of the um, uh, wall. Some of the branches coming over the uh, greenhouse. Some clown had decided to put a ladder up to this tree, so he was right over the top of the greenhouse. Right? That is the sort of thing that I mean. I didn't stay very long. Has anyone else been called? That is quite important because if you've never seen a swarm before in your garden, um, you're going to panic. You're going to find out everybody in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and the last thing you want is to go along there um, and you can't park anywhere because there's so many beekeepers um, all parked, all waiting to collect a... Uh, all coming to collect a swarm. So if anybody else has been called, then um, sorry, but you've got to walk away from it. Give me a mobile number uh, and ask them to call you if the swarm leaves. Now, it's likely to leave any time between perhaps 10 in the morning at 4 in the afternoon. Now, I know what the books tell you. I know what teachers tell you. I'm telling you that I've seen swarms in flight before and after those times so 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 be a uh, uh, be sensible and there's no point turning up if the swarm has um, uh, just left take their number as well because you may well get head up uh, held up ask them if a ladder's needed and literally anything above head height will need probably need either a step ladder or a um um or a uh, a ladder of some description, extension ladder. Uh, do they have one? Yes or no? Uh, if they've got one, access to one, then that's, uh, then that's fair enough. This is a good one. Ask them if there's a beekeeper nearby or if there are bees in a tree or a building. Because very often they know of a, uh, a beekeeper who's nearby 
And a couple of three years ago, I had a call from a lady saying that her neighbour had got um, uh, a swarm of bees in her garden. Um, could I go and collect them? So um, I said, well, uh, yes. And they were actually only about three or four miles from me. So I said yes and uh, uh, arranged uh, to go. Nobody else had been called. When I got there, um, I uh, saw the lady who seemed very, very pleasant. And I'd taken taken the swarm, which wasn't very big. And uh, I said, um, you're out in a sort of rural, fairly rural area. Have you got any uh, other beekeepers around or do you know any bees in trees? Oh, yeah, she said, um, my neighbour's a beekeeper. She said, that's the lady who phoned you. And I thought to myself, yeah, it's probably her bees that, that swarm. So, you know, you, you, you've you got to make sure you don't end up going doing people's uh, beekeeping for them. Anyway, you arrive. The general public really do vary considerably. I have had all types. Um, well, I'll say all types. I expect there's some that I haven't had, um, but I've certainly had quite a quite a variation of them. Uh, of course, you get the know-alls that know absolutely everything about everything, um, and they're usually the sort of people that um, that have failed at everything. But they do they, they do do know it all. You can usually dismiss them the same as their families often do. Then, of course, you get those that are that are frightened. And some people are genuinely frightened of, of bees. It's no good saying, oh, they're, they're, they're all right, come a bit closer. Um, don't, don't, don't push it. Um, you usually hear that somebody's allergic. Oh, but it's always, oh, my wife or my husband. And again, I had um, uh, a little while ago, uh, a man phone up and say that he um, uh, got to have the bees removed because his wife's allergic. So... Um, I've heard all this before, and that's why allergic is in inverted commas. Anyway, I chug along there, and a um, uh, lady came to the door. So I said, where are the bees? Oh, she said, I'll show you. So anyway, she uh, she followed me and uh, to the bush, and I said, well, you better not get too close. Oh, I'll be all right, she said. Um, uh, anyway, she showed me where they were, and uh, uh, somebody appeared from an upstairs window, shouting through a curtain that he'd drawn over the open window. Uh, Don't you get near those bees, they'll, 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 get, uh, they'll, they'll sting you. And she said, oh, don't worry, don't take any notice of him, she said. He's frightened of bees. And he was the one who phoned me up to say that his wife was allergic. So you've got to be a little bit careful of these sort of things as well. Some are incredibly helpful and others really can be quite difficult. Um, the reason the bees are there is because... Um, uh, you're a beekeeper, therefore it's your fault. Um, but others really are incredibly helpful. And you get absolutely everything in between. The really good ones um, uh, offer you a cup of tea and a slice of really nice cake. But you as a beekeeper are really an ambassador for the craft. So you're absolutely fine with some people. You can have a laugh and a joke, but you have perhaps got to be a little bit diplomatic with others, which is something I've always had a little bit of difficulty with. <clears throat> Try not to cause any damage. Um, so don't start digging holes in the lawn or anything like that. Or um, if you see that the bees are in an ornamental tree, don't start hacking it about with your saw because um, you won't get... Um, uh, uh, you won't get thought any more of for, uh, for doing that. Leave it tidy um, behind. So if you if you have got some smoker fuel or whatever, uh, make sure you clean everything up. Don't forget to thank them. And uh, swarms genuinely are worthless. You get quite a lot of people saying, well, are they worth any money? Um, and expecting to get paid for them. Um, you've very quietly got to say that you're actually doing them a favour and getting rid of the bees so that the um, uh, there's no problem uh, with them. Now, I'm not giving you advice on this, um, but sort out your insurance uh, policy because you can possibly do some damage to uh, their property. And the other thing is, of course, you may not be able to, to, to charge for 
the service. Check with the insurance. I'm not telling you um, one way or another. Things that's useful to know. <clears throat> Bees prefer to walk uphill than they do go downhill. They will go downhill, but not, uh, not willingly. <laughs> they tend to be attracted to where bees have been before. So if you've got a new container, such as a new scarecrow, or a new box or Alibaba basket, if you can find one, um, your very first swarm, leave it in there overnight so it gets a really uh, nice um, bee smell. If you shunt them out straight away, um, that doesn't happen. Now, if, if, you, if you get it smelling the bees, it's going to be easier to get um, a swarm to go in there uh, next time. <clears throat> um, well, sorry. Uh, bees will stay with a, uh, with a queen. So if you can clip and or cage her, that would help. Um, now, the queen can sometimes be on the outside of the swarm, and I've got a photograph later. If you spray them with a little, little water, it tends to hold them. Don't overdo it. Just spray them enough so that they... If, it, if they do think, uh, they think it's, it's raining and it will, will hold them a lot better. Now, there may be several virgins, especially after a few days of uh, poor, uh, poor flying uh, weather, when virgin queens have emerged, they're running around the hive, the bees are keeping them apart, out comes the sun, whoosh, out goes a swarm um, together with the virgin queens. I uh, already mentioned this, any time between about 10 and 4, they, they may fly, but they're less likely to fly if cool. Uh, so if perhaps one day is warm, a swarm has um, uh, landed, the following day uh, you go to collect it and it's cool, they're less likely to uh, uh, a fly. Now, how long do they settle? Well, some of them I've only had since settle for a quarter of an hour or so, so minutes. Um, others uh, settle sometimes for days. Sometimes they'll actually stay there and build a nest. So when you first see it, you don't know when it will fly off, unless, of course, it's before 10 or after 4. Don't dither, get stuck in. Possible water spray, if you, um, if you wish. Don't overdo it, whatever you do, because you drown them. <clears throat> Have a glance on the outside. This is not knowledge gaining. Um, by observation, you can check that you've got young bees there. Some of them will have pollen, although young ones won't. Um, you get drones in a swarm. Why on earth they um, go, I don't know, because they're not needed. And um, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, a queen. Try to get them into a container as uh, quick as you can. Um, if sometimes you can shake a branch uh, or a twig and uh, they will uh, fall into your container. If it's a, a rigid uh, bush or a, uh, or a hedge or something like that, you clearly can't do that, or a gatepost, then just turn the box, your container upside down, and um, they should run in. You may need to give them a little bit of smoke to start them, um, but once they uh, once they smell your container, they should go in. They don't always, but they should. <clears throat> and don't forget, it gets heavier. So if you just sort of perch it up on top of a hedge or a bush or a little tree or something, and um, uh, it isn't very uh, stable, uh, the heavier it gets, the more likely it's likely to uh, uh, fall off. So once you've got it, put your cloth on the ground. Turn your container upside down. Um, the bees will start fanning. Put something underneath it just so the bees can come back and, uh, and go inside. Once the bees start fanning, uh, you're usually okay. So all the bees in the air should come down within half hour or so. Uh, some are easier than others. This looked easy, but in fact it wasn't. I thought that they were just going to go up there, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried. In the end, I had to resort to plan, uh, plan B. This one in a little ornamental tree, 
it had come from uh, the house chimney. There's two houses. That's one on the left. They've had bees in there 20 years, I suppose. So um, skep over the top. Um, it did actually take on that one. The bees took some time to go in, but they did. Don't damage plants. Don't just start chopping things around because some of these things are actually quite slow growing and the uh, uh, their owners are always going to see the scars. Just as I came out um, to um, uh, to get in my car, I saw some bees flying in um, uh, in these brambles in the same house. And there's another swarm that must have come from uh, somewhere else, not the same nest. So I collected that one as well on the same day. So keep your eyes skinned. <clears throat> and one of our new newish members um, uh, only lives a mile away. Um, I let her have them, and there's both the skeps. Look. So what the uh, easy way of doing it is to put just to put a board up against the front of the hive. And the left-hand one has got um, the sacking on. The one on the right, I ran out of a cloth, so the poor old dog's um, uh, towels had to get used uh, uh, for that one. Look for the queen uh, going in. I, I can't remember quite what we did. I think we only put one in this particular hive out of those, those two. And uh, find her and clip a marker. I couldn't find her earlier. Clip a marker. There she is. She should just run in with the rest of the bees. Uh, and there they are, they're going in nicely. Oh, no, they're not. They've decided against that. So they obviously, bees obviously like polyhives as much as I do. Now, sometimes you might uh, might need just a little bit of light trimming so that you can get your container underneath. And something like that, you can just shake straight in, which is what I did. Perhaps a little bit of smoke. Uh, this must get, shake it in. Turn it upside down in a tear in hurry, otherwise the uh, bees will run out onto the um, uh, the sacking. Fold it round and uh, and away we go off home. This one wasn't very easy. There's a swarm there, and you can see the um, uh, the wire netting wrapped round here. And of course, they got caught up in that. And could we get them out? I don't. Um, uh, they just didn't want to know. Um, this uh, girl, Sigri, uh, she's only just started keeping bees. And uh, this was to set her up. She was a gardener on this property. And um, uh, uh, she found this swarm and um, uh, was, we, we took it to her home, put it in her hive, and she set up beekeeping with it. This one here is in a vet's car park. And there's a swarm right up there. <coughs> so it was quite difficult to get down. So um, uh, the Land Rover was uh, not my Land Rover, but the uh, beekeeper's Land Rover backed up against it. And uh, he got on the back, brushed the bees down because they were quite difficult to get. He's got a nuke box there. So what he did was uh, found the queen, put it in a, a queen cage in the nuke box, and Brush the bees into the air so they're they're um, uh, they're flying in the air. These bees are fanning. Down they come into the box uh, like that. Right, and then uh, off we go into the vets for a cup of tea for half hour. Come back. Most of the bees are in the box. Um, wrap it up. Off we go home. If there are any bees left, um, they don't usually hang around too long before they decide to go. Uh, uh, to go home. Uh, I know some people go back at dusk if you want to do so, but um, there isn't always a uh, need to. And then back home, set the hive up, and uh, you can see what he's used for his board at the front. It wasn't a particularly uh, large swarm, but try and get your cloth over the edge of the board if you can otherwise very often some of the bees will go underneath take the queen with it and of course it's then going to be much more difficult to get them to run up into the into the hive <clears throat> sometimes um you get very small swarms of which this one uh was uh, it's fairly typical of some of the small ones i get um that was in a compost uh, bin 
really quite un, unviable. And there they are in the bottom of my skep, look. I think they're probably coming from a collapsing colony and there could be a problem. So um, I'm afraid I exterminated them and probably an easy way of doing it is put them in a, uh, in a, a plastic bag or plastic sack, fold it up and put it in the freezer. It, uh, sorry, um, I know it's probably not good for beekeepers to tell the general public that they uh, kill bees because of course uh, we've got public on our side at the moment but if they're sick um, they're going to stay sick uh, if they've got anything they might spread it to other colonies a little colony like that really isn't going depending on the time of the year it really isn't going to uh, do much good um, and of course it was small for a reason so um, it's probably not worth um, doing anything with this is a small swarm in a timber yard. Again, a very small swarm look. Uh, but have a look at the outside. Have you spotted it? There's the queen there. And there she is on the outside of the swarm. Um, now, if you look at those bees and the queen, that tells me something. <clears throat> well, my assessment of that lot is they came from a managed colony. And the reason is that I've never ever come across a queen as yellow as that or bees as yellow as that that live long in the wild. Certainly not over winter and long enough to uh, put out uh, a swarm. So I think they came from a managed colony. The queen was clearly fertile. She wasn't, um, uh, uh, she wasn't a virgin. Um, therefore, my guess is that she was failing and they probably swarmed on a supersedure cell. Now, in that case, um, because they shouldn't, the bees shouldn't be uh, diseased or sick in any way, it's probably okay to use the bees, probably for bolstering up a, uh, a small colony. <clears throat> um, this queen, I know she looks darker there, but that, that was very definitely her. Uh, you just do not get these yellow, uh, as yellow as that in the wild. Uh, this swarm here, <clears throat> I th it, it, it had a clip queen, and I think it walked about 50 yards from where the bees were. Now, because of the fence, it was difficult to get over the other side to, um, uh, uh, to pick them up in any way. So this frame, old brood frame, uh, was put down for the bees to climb on. And this is one of the reasons that you ought to be taking an old brood frame. It doesn't have to be a good one. Anything old will do. Will, will do. Uh, oh, incidentally, the um, what I forgot to mention was the uh, one with the willow tree and the three posts where Sigri was um, uh, taking the swarm. I forgot to mention that we got a um, an old comb uh, down there. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, you'll be able to see it on the recording. Uh, anyway, um, there is the comb, and you can see the bees have climbed up onto the comb. Well, then shake them into your box or whatever it is, put it down and have another go. Once you've got the queen, of course, uh, you are okay. I tried desperately hard to try and find her on there, but I can't find her on there. Now, instead of running uh, a swarm up the front of the hive, what you can also do is put the combs in, and just dump the uh, swarm in on the top. Just, just, just hammer them down as hard as you can. They'll fall out straight on top like that. If bees land quickly like that, they don't fly in the air. Um, so then they will go down between the combs. You can put the crown board on and away you go. Now, if you want to find a, a, a queen in a swarm, Bump your skep down on the ground like that. Have a look at the, the surface. If you see the queen, you can pick her out. If not, just, just turn it round and do the same again. And you can generally pick out the uh, queen um, that way. Um, you need to be a little bit careful that they don't, the uh, worker bees don't sting you, but they, uh, uh, I, I can't remember the last time I got stung anyway. <coughs> I like showing this photograph, firstly because it's the only one I've got with this um this happening 
But this is a man called George Wakeford, who um, uh, really was very influential in my early days. Um, he, he, he wasn't a very good uh, teacher, but he was brilliant for, um, uh, for teaching because I sort of watched him and I copied him. And um, he, was, he was the best handler of bees by a very, very long way that I've ever come, come across. And that's how he did his beekeeping. Never wore a, a veil or gloves in his life. That, that's, that's all he did. And that man could tame, and I mean tame, uh, the most vicious of colonies. Anyway, uh, that's enough of George Wakeford. Um, this is what I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> you can see the queen in there. Probably three or four workers as well. Put a little bit of wire on that. Um, uh, so if you get a queen inside, what you can do is um, then wire it to your skep. Once you've wired it to your skep, even with that number of bees in there, um, a swarm will go uh, in it. And if you are in the slaughter, a bit interested, I think I've just noticed my divining rods there, but I won't say anything about that tonight because it's... Uh, uh, it's uh, this is instructional. So um, again, put your sheet or your sack or whatever down on the ground. I tend to do that uh, early on, so I know where it is and it's all done. And then raise up a little bit to allow the bees to uh, to fly fly in there. And I find usually within about half an hour, they're um, uh, the vast majority of them are in. Tie them up nice and securely, uh, take them home, and then you can put them in a, in a, in a hive. <clears throat> uh, give shade. This was a baking hot day, and I'd run out of virtually everything. Um, and um, this was an ex-beekeeper who, uh, oh, they'd given up bees uh, some, some time earlier. They still just happened to have a skep in the shed, I think. Um, that was something to do with the grandson, and they had a piece of uh, plywood, and this was a flannelette sheet. So um, uh, we wrapped it up, and I took it to a couple who'd lost their bees over winter, and I said to him, look, you've got to release this lot quickly um, because there's plywood on the bottom. This is a flannelette sheet, and it's not going to get too much um, air through there. Um, they will they will suffocate. So I said, get me into a hive quickly. So this was about halfway through the afternoon, I suppose. And um, anyway, I had a phone call the following morning. Those bees are dead. So I thought, oh dear, what now? Of course, I was thinking pesticide um, uh, poisoning and that sort of thing. So anyway, I went along there and they hadn't done as I suggested. They left them uh, overnight and there they were, an, a lovely swarm dead. So make sure that a swarm can breathe. It might not be obvious. You might think, oh, there's only a few bees in there. Um, that, um, that bucket or, or the box or whatever, there's going to be enough air in. It's surprising how much they use. I mentioned earlier that swarm built comb uh, very fast. This was a whisper green look, and I know I should cover that up, but I'm happy to tell you that, uh, well, not happy to, but um i'm uh, uh, i'm open enough to say that even occasionally we get it wrong and i can't quite remember what 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 happened um whether it was an incoming swarm that thought this was a bait hive or not i don't know anyway it didn't have the full complement of uh frames uh they'd obviously fill, filled up um started work on um uh, the drawn comb, uh, but they built this lot in uh, in a very short space of time, like a couple of three days. If any of you are interested, look at this look, castellations in brood chambers. And you know you should never, ever use castellations in brood chambers. Well, we do, and I've been using them for over 50 years. So that's another bit of learning for you. So hive in a stray swarm, I suggest you hive it on foundation, if you can isolate it from your other bees and don't feed it for four days, why? <clears throat> well, bees bring nectar or honey with them. If they do, on the off chance, come from a colony that's infected with um, a foul brood, um, they, of course, could bring the spores 
uh, with them. I have to say, I've only ever known that happen on one occasion in 56 years of beekeeping. Um, so it is very, very rare anyway. But the thinking is that if you have comb, the food they bring with them, they'll just put it straight in into the comb and that then keeps the, um, uh, keeps the infection going. But if you put them on foundation, they use the honey to produce wax to draw comb out and it just gets the infection uh, and the bacteria out of the system. Isolate for obvious reasons. When I say isolate, uh, 10 feet is better than two. Um, uh, 10 yards is better than 10 feet. That, that, that's really what, what, what I mean. Um, if you put a swarm in a, uh, in a hive, there's a reasonable chance of it absconding. <coughs> uh, if you heard me, I think on uh, Tuesday, you'll know the reason why, but of course I won't tell you now, so please don't ask. Just go and look at the recording for Tuesday and you'll, you'll, you'll know. Um, if you clip the queen, of course, they can't go particularly far. Uh, if you don't like clipping queens, just cage her for a couple of days or put a queen excluder underneath the brood chamber. But of course, if you do that, uh, it stops drones going in and out. And if you have got a, a, uh, a virgin queen uh, in there, if you have, of course, she can't get out to, uh, uh, to mate. Keep them in the shade. Even though you put them in a hive, put them in the shade because I have had them. Um, uh, swarms abscond. I'm pretty certain because of um, uh, because of too hot. Check for foul brood <clears throat> for uh, several weeks, and I mean check. Don't just have, have a gawk and uh, say they're all right. Uh, shake the bees off two or three frames every time. Have a look at both sealed and unsealed brood. Uh, check it. Uh, you may need to requeen quite quickly because perhaps there's something wrong with the bees. You don't like them or they might be a bit spiky or as they sometimes are when they settle down. Um, or it may be that the what you thought was a fertile queen uh, isn't, uh, isn't laying anymore. So you may need to keep an eye on it. Now, if the swarm is yours, you might um, uh, treat it a bit differently. Uh, if you actually want to increase, uh, hive it, as I've just mentioned, but really because it's your own swarm and you should know if you've got foul brood or not, uh, there's no need to hive it on foundation. There's no need for isolation uh, either. So you can put it right next to the other ones on a comb uh, if you like. In the original colony where the swarms come from, uh, reduce your queen cells uh, to one. Don't forget the queen has probably, um, because the queen's gone, and you reduce the queen cells to one. If there's any young, eggs and young larvae there, they will put up emergency cells. So if you go through, let's say three days later and six days later and cut out what there is, the bees won't swarm on the first a queen cell that emerges. <clears throat> so then you can, of course, uh, put the uh, swarm back, but of course, remove the queen. Now you can do that if, um, uh, as she's going up the board, or perhaps shaking in the, um, uh, or bumping down in the scare wheel box or whatever. And I would always add a super, I think, even though they, you, you might not think they need it. Give them another super. Now, here's something that's becoming much more of an issue. Since we've gone over to open mesh floors, uh, very often a clipped queen will come out, can't fly, go underneath the floor, exactly the same as this. So, of course, you've got your swarm, but you haven't got a climber tree to do it. <clears throat> so that's nice and easy. Bump them out. Uh, Literally, just take the queen away and uh, they will go back home. But if you bump them out on the ground, uh, if you just put a stick up to the front, uh, front of the hive, they'll climb up that. 
Uh, building up a swarm, I suggest that you build it up naturally. I like to because one thing you'll um, uh, uh, you'll learn a lot more. And I think there's something false about uh, uh, feeding. Uh, certainly during the summer, only feed if necessary. It's got to be a pretty poor um, uh, uh, weather conditions um, or um, or is next to dearth or something like that on. Obviously, you don't want to lose it through starvation. Um, but if it's collecting enough, let it carry on. Um, if it does run short of food, you could give it cones of food from another uh, colony. Uh, inspect regularly, as I mentioned, and check that the queen is laying well, because some of them lay okay for a, a week or two and uh, then either fail or disappear or up go the supersedure cells. Requeen if needed, but only you know that. But that could be on two things. Could be because the bees aren't really what you like or there's a problem with the queen. And if it's a small uh, swarm, and perhaps if it's a little bit later on, uh, let's just give it a little bit of brood, a, a frame frame of brood. Still brood if you can, because it builds it up quicker. So what can you do with a swarm then? Well, you can chuck a couple together if you like, two or more together. Uh, on many occasions, I'll put two, three, four uh, swarms together. Um, they don't fight. Um, just uh, chuck one down on the board, another one on top of it. Uh, you can either let the bees sort the queens out or you can you can do it. You might just like the look of one lot of bees better than another. Uh, perhaps if you've got a small colony, uh, something that might have um, uh, gone queenless uh, a, a bit earlier. It, it, we all tend to get these, uh, these uh, sort of things uh, these days that we never used to get. Uh, you can... Uh, you can probably take the queen away from a small colony if that's the reason that it was so small. Chuck the swarm in and uh, they will basically overwhelm the little colony and you should be okay. If you've got a colony with laying workers or perhaps a drone laying queen or a queenless colony, you can literally just chuck a, chuck a swarm in. Laying workers, I've found, you generally get away with. Drone laying queen, you're going to have to go in and get the queen uh, out, um, hoof her out, possibly uh, leave it uh, queenless for an hour or so and then chuck the swarm in. Uh, but it's surprising why you can get away with the swarm. If you're into queen rearing, you've got a big swarm, you can start queen cells on them. And the cost of that then is a zero. If it's done earlier, if it's a nice early swarm, if you do want to increase, uh, then you can split um, uh, uh, split it later. So collecting, hiving, and carrying swarms, uh, really, it is fun, uh, just like the rest of beekeeping and uh, how I enjoy some of my time during the summer. That's it. Thanks very much uh, for uh, listening. And I'm sorry, Richard, was a quarter of an hour slow in starting or late in starting. I always get the blame. No, not always. Just when it's your fault. Uh, thanks, Roger. Uh, so we've had a number of questions come in. Some are not related to um, tonight's talk. So if we've got time, we'll, I'll get to those ones. Um, Michael had to leave, wanted you to talk about the danger of disease, which you have done. Uh, so that's fine. So that's one sorted. Well, if you think about it, in, if you get a reasonable size swarm, um, uh, a colony's disease isn't going to be big enough to build up. It's the smaller ones that I, I find the problem with. Um, but I, I really have only ever heard of, I haven't come across, but I've heard of um, foul brood in one swarm. And this is what a lot of people um, uh, warn about, don't they? Oh, you, 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 you'll, you'll get foul brood. Well, I'll tell you what, I've uh, seen a lot more foul brood sold than what I have come in by um, um, uh, by uh, by swarms, um, and this we in West Sussex we got like a triangle, it's a, um, an EFB hotspot, and somebody who was a beginner heard about a swarm in this triangle, came and got it, and it wasn't my association; it was an adjoining one. Oh, 
yeah, 15 years ago now, I think, um, uh, they had what they what the uh, bee inspectors uh, call a uh, a safari, where the bee inspector and some of the members go around to I don't know six members or eight members or something like that and just check their bees, um, and uh, they found this um, this one infected with the EFB, and um, the uh, uh, that's what had happened. The beginner came in and, uh, and got it, which is really unfortunate because um, it was a it was a it was a learning opportunity. But the poor beginner, I don't think, would have been very happy about it. But when you're picking a swarm up, you don't know. Anyway, yep. Subsequent, subsequent to that, then um, Maria's <laughs> told not to feed a swarm for two days, but it's four days even better to prevent pathogens. Well, they take. Um, about three days worth of food with them in my experience now if the I, I think two days might not quite be enough but if the weather's good and the other colonies are bringing in nectar there's absolutely no need to feed us warm whatsoever none whatsoever and uh, i've said i think lots of times it worries me, this modern thing about feed, 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 and if you're in any doubt, feed again, because I don't think there's any need to, and you're feeding bees a sugar that they're not used to, which uh, is becoming more and more of a concern to me, I think. Um, and uh, I, I, there's no need for it in the first place. Brian says, any tips for taking a swarm out of a chimney or a cavity wall? No, not really. Um, uh, yes, you'll get some clever people who tell you, or vacuum cleaners and all sorts of things like that. Um, it really is a specialist um, uh, uh, area, and if, even I don't touch them. I did get involved on a... a um, uh, um, cool. Uh, National Trust property in Somerset. Um, I was asked to go down there. There was three, well, they weren't swarms of colonies in, in buildings, um, but they put scaffolding up. And, um, you know, you either need that or some sort of cherry picker or something of that nature, which, of course, are quite expensive to uh, hire. Um, so I wouldn't, um, uh, I I I wouldn't bother with either of those if they're... Um, if they're there, they're there. The answer with all these things is uh, if everybody does this form control like they should do, there shouldn't be an issue. Um, but cavity walls, you know, you, you just can't can't get inside them. Um, if, if that is the case, then uh, it, it's generally an established colony. Uh, it's surprising the number of people who these days who are happy to have bees in their, in their house. And if they're not near a window um, or a door, uh, they, they're they usually uh, tolerated. Yes. Um, a, a little bit of confusion over what you said about marking and clipping. Um, concerns over what happens if it's a virgin queen that's in the swarm and you're clipping. I think... I made sure that uh, it was fertile queen that I was uh, I was discussing, um, but yeah, if it's obviously if it's a fertile queen, then don't uh, don't clip it. A virgin queen, yeah. Virgin, uh, sorry, did I say yeah, virgin queen? Yeah, if it's a virgin queen, don't don't clip them. And just wondered, somebody <coughs> wondered about uh, marking a virgin queen. Um, no, I wouldn't before, bother with it. Yeah, do, uh, ju ju just do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know there's this view that it makes it easier for the swallows to spot, but mm, yeah. This person mentioned <laughs> pheromones and the smell of the paint, so I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't think there's an issue because I've known of uh, queen rearers, serious queen rearers, who mark their uh, queens as soon as they emerge. So I really don't think it's an issue. Uh, I've never had a problem, but I, I don't do it as a matter of course. Um, I really don't think it's an issue, Richard. No. Um, somebody wants to know if you charge for call-outs. No. <laughs> no. Um, 
I'm a member of BBKA and the um, insurance forbids you. Um, now, I have checked in the past, uh, not with this insurer, um, but with previous insurers, and it's okay to have something put in your tank. There's, there's, there, there, there isn't a problem with that. It's where you've actually effectively made a contract. You say, well, it'll cost you 30 or 40 pound or whatever it is to, to, to take them away. If you're not insured, it doesn't matter too much. Um, but personally, I think it's quite important if you've got insurance, that is one of the areas where you may well um, need it because all sorts of things uh, 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 do happen. Um, you know, people trip up. You know, if you're carrying a skep of, uh, skep of bees, you can't see where your feet are. All sorts of things like that. You trip over and uh, fall through somebody's Dutch lights. <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, no. I know that you can't be on the Asian Hornet team if you are not a full... <laughs> yeah, look, Richard, I, 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 I think we're wrong talking about uh, insurance here because in two years' time, the situation might change, yet the, yeah. the video is still likely to be um, uh, available. So I, I don't think we should. Okay. Uh, two questions from Finn. Uh, what months of the year are bees swarms most likely? Oh, I've heard of swarms already. Um, uh, yeah, so any time really from mid-April, naturally in my area, right through to about mid-July. Um, but of course, we're getting, with the problems with the Queens these days, um, we're getting swarms, uh, col colonies swarming on um either soup procedure or emergency cells later than that and quite commonly i'm hearing them up no even in september but naturally it should be um may and june in my area um, now that'd be closed down a bit the further north uh, you go um a lot of the early ones of course because of course people don't put supers on early enough and you get a, a few days, uh, I think I've been through this on one of the other web, um, uh, webinar presentations. Um, of course, what you happen is, is you, 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 you get the brood nest, um, uh, you get the sun beating down for a few days, warms the temperature up. In the spring, there's actually quite a lot of nectar and pollen. And because the colonies haven't built up enough, they don't need it for feeding so much brood. So, of course, what do the bees do with it if they've got no, no super? They pack it around the brood. That then restricts the queen, up go the queen cells, and that's why you end up with, or um, well, one of the reasons you end up with um, uh, swarms earlier than you would normally get. Although, having said that, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that naturally, in this country, with their native bees, um, Swarms were always early. I'm, I'm pretty convinced. I, I, I doubt if naturally they'd be after um, early or mid June, but that's, that's another matter. Um, we're in a, a managed situation, and um, bees tend to do things in response to beekeepers rather than um, instinct. And the second of his questions was, what are the beekeeping ethics of taking your neighbouring beekeepers bee swarm and keeping them for your own? Well, if your neighbouring beekeeper didn't want them, uh, they've effectively abandoned them, haven't they? That's what I would say. Hang on, we, we could end up in court repeating this if we're not careful. Well, it's my <laughs> understanding legally that the bees belong to whoever land the bees land on uh and if you can keep them in your sight they're still yours providing right. you don't trespass right um right uh apparently um yeah so if if you've got two beekeepers side by side and bees come out of one's um side 
and swarms on the other one. If you can keep them within your sight all the time, as I understand it, they are still yours, even though they're on somebody else's land. But you would have to ask permission to fetch them. Oh yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if they say if they say no, then you've got a bit of a fight on your hand. I I can't I can't ever think this has happened. Well, not I, I can remember anyway. Hmm. Um. Cass says drones in the swarm not needed. If it is a virgin queen. Uh, are the drones not there as an insurance for the Virgin Queen as nature <clears throat> intended many years ago? Well, if if they are, of course, you're getting inbreeding, aren't you? <laughs> but um, the vast majority of swarms should go with fertile queens. Therefore, they're, they're, they're not needed, are they? The vast majority... It's only casts go with, um, or naturally, it's only casts that go with virgin queens. Um, and personally, I, I don't think casts in this in this part of the world are a natural thing. I, th I, I think it's only because of the exotic bees we've got and their different sort of behaviour patterns. But it's, uh, that's only personal view. Paul says, do you ever merge small casts to make one viable colony? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, unless one is sick. Have a look at them. You can see if, they, you can see if they're sick, Richard. Um, if they are, then I'm sorry, they've got to go in the freezer, um, which I have to say I've only ever done about three times. Another thing you could do is with your garden sprayer, fill it with soapy water and then, um, and then uh, spray them with that. Um, that that quickly kill, uh, kills them off. Um, yeah, sometimes um, I've even had large swarms, and I I've had no one to uh, pass them on to. Don't want any more. I've almost run out of kit. Uh, then put two or three, even big swarms together, and um, uh, that they're, they're they're fine. They're okay. Do you just chuck them in? Yeah. Chuck them in. Let them get on with it. <clears throat> yep. Um, how do you tell if the queen is a virgin or not? Oh, well, that's that's uh, that's that's a visual thing. Um, very occasionally, even experienced beekeepers will get it um, uh, get it wrong. But in general, um, fertile queens are bigger than virgin queens in general. Um, the abdomen is uh, more swollen. I know there's this view that um, queens always slim or, or stop stop laying before they go out. I think that's probably true of uh, the um, uh, the more prolific ones, the so Italians and Carniolans and well, Buckfast, which are probably a mixture of those uh, anyway. Um, there's no there's no doubt in my mind that they do, but I don't think the less prolific ones actually go off lay uh, that much. So they probably don't lose that much body size. Um, so you can probably tell them uh, quite, uh, quite easily. Uh, if they've got all their, all their wings, you can see that the, um, the outside of the wing um, is, oh, I wish I could bring that, that one up now. Uh, that yellow one, uh, that yellow queen was probably two years old, I would think. Um, is wings were splayed out, and the edges of them were a bit bit tattered. So she she been in existence certainly a, a, a couple of years. Now, of course, you won't get that with a virgin queen. The uh, uh, edges of the wings are um, a fairly sort of smooth. They're not they're they're, they're not jagged. They're, they're not torn away. It's 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 not easy, I know. Uh, virgin queens probably behave more variably than fertile queens do. Fertile queens will tend to, uh, when you're looking at them, it's almost as if they 
they know what they're doing because they've done it uh, they've done it before and they, they, they just sort of walk in with the rest of the bees virgin queens can either sort of sit there almost sort of huddled up or they could be um, uh, very skittish and flitting around over the top of the uh, uh, other bees and, um, um, uh, and flapping their wings and, and doing all sorts of things like that you can you 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 can generally tell but I, I have been caught out um, and I'm sure a lot of other beekeepers have been caught out as well. Um, let's have a look. Um, if one is trying to catch a swarm in a brood box with lemongrass, cotton wool impregnated lure, how many frames would you suggest should go into the brood box? I've, I've never done that. Um, I'm assuming they mean a bait hive. Yeah, I think so. Right. Um, well, what I would suggest with a bait hive is if you've got it at home, obviously no good in an out apron. If you've got it at home, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I've never ever used lemongrass or, uh, or uh, a swarm law or anything like that at all. Um, I think it's fairly well, well known um, uh, what I do, and I'm successful enough, and I reckon that's good enough for me. Um, <clears throat> but if you, um are in any doubt just put one comb in there one old manky comb um you'll you should be able to tell uh if that swarm is being uh scout uh, if that um bait hive is being scouted by the colony that's, uh, that, that's swarming you can generally tell anything up to about six days uh, beforehand occasionally they do they do come in very very quickly but usually they're scouted first you can see that bees are going in and out so you've got a, an inkling most of the time that a swarm is coming but if you've got it at home even if you work it doesn't matter just go and check it every night when you get home from work and if you've got a swarm come in Shake the bees off that comb into the box. Fill the box up with foundation and burn the, um, burn the comb. Okay, the bees might have put a little bit of uh, nectar or honey in it. That doesn't matter if it does happen to be um, uh, infected, then you, you won't be uh, um, carrying the infection on. So that, I think, is the easy way of, do, uh, of, uh, of doing that. Question. If you hive a swarm... In well, the hang on, hang, excuse me, hang on just a minute. Um, if the person is uh, still listening, if that didn't answer their question, then perhaps I'll just put a, a note up uh, saying, no, it didn't. What about so-and-so? Sorry, Richard. <clears throat> okay. um, if you hive a swarm in the apiary it had emerged from, would it not abscond to the site the scouts have located prior to swarming? Well, it could do, and this might be one of the reasons that, um, uh, that colonies do abscond. It, it, it might be. We don't know. I mean, I gave you one of, what I thought was one of the reasons on, on Tuesday, um, but it, 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 it could be anything. And of course, we're we're probably never ever going to know. Okay, there might be some clever, sophisticated stuff um, uh, invented in the future, which would determine that. But we we simply don't know. Okay, is it a good idea to treat a new swarm for varroa? And if uh, so, how long after? I've, I've I've never done it, but I know people who who have. Um, and um, they sort of spray with oxalic acid or perhaps um, a quick blast of, no, I'm not, no, I'm not supposed to tell you that. Or I will tell you, but I shouldn't tell you, and you shouldn't do it. <clears throat> um, that is a, a quick blast of a thymol product because, of course, you haven't got any brood there. So all the varroa are going to be on the bees. The problem with that is 
that if it's not in the instructions to do that, I think technically you're committing an offence. So um, that that's why I, well, I have told you because it's recorded, isn't it? But yeah, okay. Varroa should be treated with uh, appropriate treatments that are approved by the veterinary medical. Dead right, according to instructions. Yeah. Now, to the best of my knowledge, that isn't in the instructions because I assume you're going to treat a colony that's got brooding. Yeah. So it's it, it's two weeks, then two weeks, if indeed that's the one you're using. But my guess is, and I don't know, that if you treated them um, for a lesser lesser time, don't forget it's going to be at least nine days before Varroa can get into the brood. So they've all they've all got to be on the bees. Um, I, I've got to be, yeah. Um, what, I, what I've just told you, uh, it's very, very definitely not advice. Um, but um, it's, um, it's up to you what, what you do, but it really ought to be kept legal. Yeah. Um, can you put the swarm directly in a nuke? I presume they mean a nuke box rather than uniting it with a nucleus colony. But I'm not sure. Can you read the question? Uh, yeah. Because it... Let me just find it again, sorry. Can you put the swarm directly in a nuke? Well, collect it into a nuke box. Um, because, yeah, that, that, well, well, what? yes, you could. Um, that's what Peter Jenkins had on the top of his Land Rover. That was just a nuke box. Um, and I did say a polynuke early on. So yeah. you, can, you, can put, you can put them into that. Um, I'm wondering if the questioner thinks about hiving it in a, a nuke box. If it's small enough, yes. Um, but a normal prime swarm, I think you'll find is, is too big for that. And it will very soon outgrow it. Super. Julie says, I started beekeeping last summer with a swarm donated from a local beekeeping association. I'm hooked. The swarm turned out to be calm and gentle and is doing really well. I've been yeah. very lucky. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. There are just a, f a very small number of people in, in beekeeping who want to wreck everything for everybody else. And I, I love collecting swarms and I um, I'm put them in a hive and seeing them develop. And what a joy that is for a beginner. And they're learning far, far more by doing that than just ordering a box that comes in the, by the carrier, uh, plonk it in. And uh, probably what you find with that, with that is that um, uh, the sellers milked off the flying bees so they don't, they don't, they're, they're, they're calm for a week. They don't sting anyone. What, what fun is that? You might as well put empty frames in. You'll get me on another talk, Richard. This always happens when you get anywhere near me, doesn't it? That's it. Blame me. <laughs> I'm not blaming you at all. It's, it's not. I don't subscribe to the blame culture unless it's somebody else's fault. <laughs> uh, You're slow reading. I know. I know. Well, I'm trying to make sense of things. Um, oh, ho, ho. that's it. Abuse the question. I know. Right Sorry. Now. How do you find the queen by banging the skep on the ground? Ah, right. What you what what you're doing is you you um uh you're banging uh I can't even pick a cup of water up can I, but there's your skep, right? You're banging it on this corner, and all the bees drop down to to this corner here, and what will happen is then they will they will spread out, cast cast your eye over it and. You can see a, a queen in a swarm, I think, a lot easier than, it, than in a colony. If you can't, um, uh, uh, can't see her, um, what is likely to happen is, they, because they go uphill, they go up, whoops, they go up this side, go, go up this side, uh, and then turn it over and bang it down on that side, and then bang them back down again. And you can easily pick out a... Uh, uh, a queen and because they're always 
upwards, facing upwards. So you're on the, um, uh, yeah, you're you're picking them up from the the back end. Yeah, there is an anatomical term that in that uh, that's misused, uh, but I forget what that was. But you're always seeing their back, their, their backs, aren't you? But you just pick them up with the wings. Okay. Both uh, wings, not one, because what will do? What they do is uh, they'll turn round and round and round, and um, that won't do their wings any good. <laughs> um, twist the wings. Are there more early swarms due to overfeeding? <sighs> yeah, you've got to give me another four hours on this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's. I, I think it's overfeeding, and people these days poke that pollen and substitute and all sorts of stuff in, in, into them, supplement. And um, what it's intended to do is to increase, build the colony up earlier. I'd like somebody to do some work on this because I'm, I'm not sure it's doing the bees any good. One of the things I think it's doing is overstretching them. So the ratio between the um, the young bees and the brood uh, is getting such that the young bees are going to struggle to feed the, the expanding uh, a brood until that emerges. Um, and I do wonder about nutrition problems and some of the problems we get with bees. I'm wondering if it, if it's not nutrition that's um, that's not a contributory uh, factor. Um, but of course, bees build up naturally. Um, to suit the environment. They build up um, uh, uh, for weather, um, the amount of daylight um, and the forage that's out there. Now, of course, a lot of people these days build them up for the all sea rate, which of course is natural. So I can see what they're trying to do, but um, uh, I gave up stimulated feeding 45 50 years ago because um i found it didn't do any good and i think there's been some uh, science that's confirmed that in in the meantime um of course what you're doing is building the colony up so quickly um that you then end up with a june gap in some places not all places i um i i've uh, I, I, I come across a lot of people talk about the June Gap and they just don't get the June Gap in their area. It's not not all that get it. Um, uh, so you're giving yourself problems further down, further down the line. And if you've got some bees uh, that are swarmy, and carniolans are very swarmy, um, they can swarm twice in one season. One of our now ex-members of Whisper Green her brother had a fruit farm and he wasn't a beekeeper, but he thought he'd buy half a dozen uh, colonies of bees. Um, so he, he got, um, he got carny owners to pollinate the fruit. Uh, anyway, he had an early swarm one year and that was an April swarm, I think. Our member went and collected it and apparently the swarm swarmed again. So did the original colony. Um, and, uh, you know, the, they don't need any help. Mm. Crikey. Um, I'm mindful of the time because we've been going for quite a while and we've had complaints in the past that the Q&A has lasted too long. So I'll remind, an, you, but I'll remind you that you can leave at any time. You don't have to see it all the way through. Oh, all right. I'll go then. <laughs> Not you. You need to oh, stay where what? you are. Last couple of questions then. Right, okay. Um, how successful may be requeening a hyped swarm with a laying queen by insert or by inserting a mature queen cell covered in tin foil. Um, well, you could obviously do it with the um, uh, uh, with, with normal um, a queen introduction. Take the old one away, and or the one from the swarm. Um, I think these days I would just check to see that the swarm has, has got see what it's got i never used to i used to take one look at them oh, i've done a lot of look at these um but these days i am finding that some swarms as i said are, are, are getting better 
Um, now, if you want to do it with a protected queen cell, which is something I mentioned a couple of weeks ago uh, in a different context, um, that's one thing the old beekeepers did when I um, first started keeping bees. Well, they didn't use tin four. They used those, um, uh, well, they're, they're called West Cell Protectors, which are um, like a little uh, circle of uh, wire with a, with a spike on the end. Uh, they, they, they used to use uh, those. Um, if you want to do it that way, um, that's absolutely fine. Um, I mean, if it fails, it fails. You've still got the old the old queen. Whereas if you take a queen away, uh, give it the boot treatment, and then give it another queen that doesn't get accepted, uh, you've, you've, you, you've got nothing left. Um, but certainly the, um, the requeening with a protected queen cell, when I started keeping bees, um, it was certainly known about by the older beekeepers. They didn't all do it. But or not regularly, but they all um, uh, they all knew how to do it if they had to. A lot of beekeepers uh, haven't, haven't even got a clue now. Uh, I mean, I don't want to keep bashing the uh, the poor old exam system, but I think if that was given as a an answer in a exam, I don't know, but I suspect it would get thrown out simply because it isn't known anymore. But it. It works, or in 80% of the cases it does. I've used it uh, quite regularly over the years. Yeah, you get failures, but you get failures with everything else. Did that answer their question? I can't remember what the question was. No. <clears throat> um, it was a swarm, whether you can requeen it with yeah. a... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. Um, you, 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 you can requeen uh, any, any colony with a... Um, uh, um, uh, a protected queen cell without taking the old queen out. It might only be eighty percent success rate, but that is actually not not bad compared to um, what some queen introduction rates are these days. A fellow beekeeper had a very weak colony last week, so he put a frame of brood in all stages from another colony, hoping for a supersedure. Today, the hive was empty. Any ideas what could have happened to the colony? Read, read that again, please. It doesn't make sense. Weak colony. Weak? Ah, weak. Why was it, wonder why it was weak. Yeah. Put um, in a frame of brood of all stages. Wanted to, hoping for supersedure, but the hive is now empty. Well, you, later. you wouldn't get supersedure. It would be an emergency cell. Um Weak colony. Possibly the weak colony wasn't um, strong enough to look after the brood, uh, but my guess is that um, Varroa's got hold of it. Uh, you've got... Well, why is it weak? Um, right. It could be that it was queenless a long time ago, so the bees are, bees are getting very old now. They just gave up. And we can't look after this. Um, that might be, that might be one, one thing. Or it could be, I'm not saying it is, but it could be something like starvation. You know, if they are a very weak colony, uh, they probably wouldn't be uh, collecting any nectar. You don't, you don't know. Yeah, uh, I think we're going well, to... Well, yeah, I, yeah. Um, uh, I will go on just, just a little bit. Uh, but last summer, I was with half a dozen people and... Um, uh, the colony is absolutely bone dry of food. And as I remember it, not one of those uh, six or eight people or whatever it is actually spotted that there was a problem. This was, this was last July. So people don't always um, see what's in, in, in front of them. So it, it might be uh, starvation, especially this late. <laughs> Anyway. And, then, and then the final one, Kath says, um, I think you used the phrase, dumping the swarm. She says, is that not likely to injure the queen? No, to no, 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 no. off the frame. No, uh, thumb, thumb them down. Um, they're, they're absolutely fine. Never, never, 
never killed a queen in that way in my life. In fact, I can't remember actually ever killing one, but um, no, 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 no problem. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. We've nearly done two hours. Have we? <laughs> cool. Um, thank you very much, Roger. Um, okay. Next uh, um, on Tuesday, um, we've got uh, five thirty mm-hmm. National Honey Monitoring Scheme, and then um, seven thirty we've got uh, bee farming with the native or near native bees. Yeah. Okay, and I, and I've got a day off, and you've got a day off. Yeah. Okay. Everybody day. will enjoy that. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs>